Please stay tuned for important disclosure information at the conclusion of this episode. Hi, and welcome to The Long View. I'm Christine Benz, Director of Personal Finance and Retirement Planning for Morningstar. And I'm Jeff Patak, Chief Ratings Officer for Morningstar Research Services. Our guest on the podcast today is Dr. Preston Cherry. Dr. Cherry is founder and president of Concurrent Financial Planning, and he also serves as assistant professor of finance and head of the personal financial planning program at the University of Wisconsin, Green Bay. In addition, he's the director of the Charles Schwab Center for Personal Financial Planning at the university. Dr. Cherry also serves as a financial advisor coach for Carson Group Coaching. Over 14 years, he has served in lead and internal financial planning roles and institutional retirement sales. He has also served as a co-investment manager at a registered investment advisor and as a mutual fund wholesaler. Dr. Cherry, welcome to The Long View. Thank you for having me, Christine. I really appreciate it. Well, we're excited to chat with you today. So we want to delve into your background. You've worked in several different capacities in the financial services industry during your career. You've been an investment wholesaler. You've also managed investment portfolios. And of course, you're a professor and a financial advisor today. So what were the pivotal events along the way that convinced you that you wanted to teach and practice financial planning as you do today? Hmm. Well, I actually started out in planning first. I started out in planning coming out of master's school back in 2006. And really the the pivotal moment came in undergrad way back in 2003. I have a mentor and his name is Jan Jasper actually. And he, um, he said, you know, Preston, I think you'll like this personal finance thing. And I said, how so? And um, I really took to his teachings when I was at Prairie View and his conversations resonated with me because he was talking about all the household topics that resonated in my household as a child, because as a child, my parents talked to us about money, Christine, you know, I was very fortunate to have those conversations. A lot of people are not privy to those. And we talked about money and life and situations that came up in our household. So when he was teaching personal finance at Prairie View, I was, I, I I lit up. I was like, wow. So he called me into his office and said, I think you may like this. So long story short, he knew some people at Texas Tech. And um, Texas Tech is you know, kind of like the, the mothership of, of financial planning in, in the academic world. And he took us to Texas Tech, introduced us to the program there. And then fast forward some more years, uh, there was an opportunity to get a master's degree. And then I, I got into financial planning. Uh, and my first job was in financial planning after I graduated there. I started out in retail banking and, and, and tellering. But while all that's important is because, uh, you know, even when I was tellering, I listened to stories with people about their money. So I carried all that in to financial planning. And I think just uh, being able to, you know, connect my stories and experiences, hearing other people's stories and experiences, and then having a mentor connect all that together when I didn't even know financial planning was a thing. I think we want to ask you about some of the other mentors that you've had during your career. But before we get to that, since you mentioned your family and it sounds like it had pretty profound impact on your decision to ultimately pursue financial planning. I think you cited your mother as a big influence in your thinking about finances. Specifically, she helped you understand the interplay between financial wellness and and psychology. Can you talk about that? Yes, I can. Uh, Thank you for asking. Uh, You know, my parents, they played a big role and mine and my sister's development, and it's actually carrying over into my niece's world now. She's 14, and it goes real deep into how, you know, household conversations can impact, you know, generations. Uh, It was very intentional when my parents uh, talked to my sister and I about life and about money. Um, You know, before there was the... (laughs) the Brene Browning of, of emotions and a shout out to, you know, Brene, you know, but you know, these, the words of vulnerability, right. Um, courage and, um, you know, bravery and all of these, all these words that, you know, these emotional, uh, almost taglines almost, which is very important. All right. Intuition, all these, my mother gave me those, Jeff. Um, she started off saying, that you can talk to me about anything 
in life. Um, you can come to me, be yourself. You can be vulnerable is another word, right? Um, and express yourself and let me know what's going on with you. You can be courageous. You can be open uh, without shame or judgment. My mom was huge and still to this day is huge on those components. It was a gift to be able to have that in our household. And um, this is where I say that, you know, people ask me, why am I so passionate about, you know, the financial psychology today and why I carry it in my practice, why I carry it in my life and why it makes so much sense and why these stories and everything that comes out of me is so natural, it seems. Well, I was given a gift, you know, from my mother and it carried over. And it just so happens that these things have big words <laughs> attached to them, like financial socialization and all these other academic -y words, so to speak. And I got kind of lucky in life that uh, these things get to be aligned with one another and I get to do them professionally. So what was the context for her to discuss financial matters with you? And it sounds like both of your parents did that, but maybe you can give some examples of how you talked about those issues in your home as you were growing up. Sure. So it was almost a mode of survival. We were a young family. So my parents were young when they married. So 21 and 18, I believe. And so they had to make some intentional decisions. And actually, it's quite phenomenal, actually, that they did that at such a young age. And they made some intentional decisions in order to invest resources in us, human resources, which were giving us access to things like education and self-worth, self-value. So uh, we grew up together as a family. My parents are now 44 years together, you know, and they're relatively young, 65 and 63 now, I think. I'm 44. Um, my, mother, my sister is 41, I believe. So, you know, we grew up together. So it was very important. We had to kind of roll and adapt. To use this phrase that's commonly used in our families, roll and adapt. They sat us down to give a specific example. You know, like in times like these, inflation and maybe even job loss, you know, events in life, you know, events. And not even just trial events, triumph events, you know, gaining a new job, uh, moving, uh, you know, so it's trial and triumph. But during these events in life, we were sat down in the living room. We actually recorded some of these things. We actually had uh, family conversations. We actually recorded them so we could go back. But anyway, we, we had these conversations, setting expectations for what the next few months were going to be like, uh, hearing us out. All right. How do you feel about that? They, they asked us, you know, how, how do you feel? How are you feeling right now? Take the temperature. You know, this is what we can do as a household. Um, this is how it's going to affect our household for a little bit. We're going to have to make some adjustments. Uh, we're going to have to adjust our mindset. We're going to have to uh, tighten our belts monetarily and also, you know, you know, with, with our minds a little bit. And then after this, this is what we're going to do next. We had those talks, family meetings. That's what I, that's what I was coming up with, family meetings. We had those talks. So it, it, meaning money and life, intertwined, and we had those talks of openness. And it really made a difference about uh, setting the tone about how we are feeling now as a family and uh, at that time and what we we're going to do to go forward. Who are some of the other mentors that influenced you in the path that you've ultimately taken professionally um, as well as in educating others in financial matters? You mentioned your family and another important mentor who sort of set you on your path. Have there been others? Sure, sure. You know, there's very rare occasions where there's bootstrap stories. Um, even in the most under-resourced areas of life, there is someone or a group of people that invested things in an individual to help you get where you are. And there's people that have done that for me. And that's why I'm so passionate about reinvesting whatever I have in me into others as much as I can. Uh, so to answer your question specifically, um, you know, obviously my parents, and there's actually a childhood friend of mine, his father, walked my college application into the university that he was teaching at for many years. <laughs> the name is Freddie Richards, Dr. Freddie Richards. And um, he talked about all the time about going to Prairie View. And I grew up in the suburbs and he wanted me and a couple other of my friends to go to Prairie View. And he was like, I want y'all to go, I want one of you to go to Prairie View. And uh, so he actually walked my college application down there. Then the quick story is um, my dad, I graduated from Prairie View and Dr. Jasper was at the ceremony. and. Um, he said, okay, wow, you know, my dad said, son, well, you, you made it. You know, you graduated today. And 
Dr. Jasper said, well, no, uh, Mr. Chair, we, we have a long way to go. Uh, well, my dad said, well, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, <laughs> I'm done. So it's your job to take him where he needs to go after this. So having those mentors and other mentors I had where I was at tech is, uh, uh, you know, Vicki Hampton, uh, Dina Katz, Harold Avinsky, Bill Gustafson. I don't want to start name dropping a whole bunch, but because I'll leave out a whole bunch of people. And then just my peer group. I think you should surround yourself with people uh, and peer groups that challenge you to grow. And there's so many people that I know that I'm sure are going to be listening to this podcast that right now I have a circle of friends, a good friend, Dr. John Moo Loving. But there's so many people that I know in this industry that support me as, and they may never say be mentors, but I respect them. I can pick up the phone as friends and, and professional people that I admire. And I say, you know, what are, you, what are your thoughts on this? And, and I just, and I listen a little bit, you know, and just say, uh, how would you handle this situation? You know, or what is your expertise? I don't know everything, you know, what's your expertise? So far as mentors is concerned, what's your peer group look like? And my peer group is full of people that are challenging me and offering me resources in order to make me better. So uh, I keep those people uh, around me. You know who you are if you're listening. Uh, and I, I appreciate them every day. And I also, to close that point, is I make sure that I keep a group around me that is you know, diverse in thought, diverse in culture, diverse in experiences, diverse in you know, their humanity, their expertise, uh, because that is the human condition. And we'll transfer that. Remember that word. Uh, we'll transfer that into how I go about teaching and dealing with my clients as well, because it's very important that we place ingredients in ourselves that we can use to communicate with others. It was very important. I want to pick up on your work teaching financial planning. You're a financial educator on multiple levels, both with your clients and then with the students that you work with. One question we've put to a number of our guests over the years is, what works in financial education? <laughs> like what sinks in with people? Do you have any strategies that you've found really resonate in terms of inculcating financial concepts in your students? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, with students and clients, I, I, as far as how people learn and receive information, you have to connect, or at least I've, this is what I've found works with, with individuals, is, you know, you open up the heart, you open up the mind. <laughs> you open up the heart, you open up the mind. And this is where leading with financial or just compassion, you don't have to say, well, you know, I know, I know we're dealing with money, but uh, money lives, but just in life and just dealing with people in general is leading with compassion. If people are, you know, feel that they're in a trusted space, they're in a good environment um, and they are, you know, heard, valued, seen, belong, uh, they are encouraged and empowered to share their story, all right? All of that builds a good environment. All that is compassion. And I found that when there is a willingness to create an environment like that, then this is where the learning begins. And that's where people can get learned. <laughs> if I could do a slang term, learned, you can get your learn on at this point. Because people want to be informed. They want to be educated. And I have clients all the time. I have students all the time. I have people all the time. They say, I want to, I want to learn. I, could you share more information on that? Uh, and I had a client here recently. Can you, can you educate me on that? All right. I want information as a consumer, you know, as a person that wants to continue learning. All right. I want to be educated. I want to be informed. I want to be, I want to learn. However, there's a stage before that. I also want to be known as a person. I want, do want to be heard. I want to be belonged. I want my unique experiences to go into what you're about to tell me or share with me. And so the initial stage of compassion and, and learning and having the willingness to learn about an individual creates that stage for education and learning. And then connecting, if I could continue with that, is... Uh, experiential learning. What does that mean? Well, yeah, 
you know, create some excitement in it. I mean, out of the textbook, you know, okay, cool. Or out of the reading something online to a person or something, that's not exciting. All right. Uh, exchange swap stories. You know, people want to hear a little bit of something, you know, well, why do I want to listen to you? You know, it has to resonate with someone. So if you could share some vulnerability, share an experience that you had, and then somebody says, okay, yeah, I can resonate with that. And then they'll share a story and they're like, oh, okay, yes, that too. All right. That's how I connect. If somebody can connect with not only you as the counterpart, but also connect with their life. So make it real life. Make any type of information or education or as a real life. If somebody can connect with their real life, then they're more open and receptive to saying, ah, okay, I'm willing to learn beyond what I came here with and receive it. So, yeah. Can you give some examples of how those principles you just outlined inform the financial planning program that you head up at the University of Wisconsin, Green Bay? Um, I, I would imagine that that some of those principles have been infused in various ways into the work that that students are doing as part of their curriculum. So can you maybe give a few examples of how that's so? Sure. So we are about to launch the Charles Schwab Foundation Center for Financial Wellness and at the University of Wisconsin Green Bay. And the reason why I mentioned that center is that one of the services in that center is peer-to-peer uh, -peer counseling. Now, this program has been done in other universities. And what it is, is that for those students that are in the financial planning program, and they're pursuing the profession, this is what they want to do, and this is what they want to do with their lives. They're actually learning the curriculum in class, and they're, you know, pursuing the life. They get to use that or utilize their skill sets and pass that on to the students across campus. And the students get to sign up for, you know, small sessions, 50-minute sessions, coaching sessions, and it's a peer-to-peer -peer coaching session, maybe on spending plan, maybe on um, you know, employee benefits, this, that, and the other. Here's the second thing. is also we have a, a personal finance class that's open to all the students across the campus. And why is this important? It's important because if you can get individuals to connect with their own lives, their personal finances with their own lives, then they're more apt to, you know, engage further and not, not only receive the information, but be actionable on it, you know? So just being, becoming aware of, you know, money information, money resources, um, and also being in a place, going back to being in a place that you belonged, heard, and valued, and you won't be shamed or judged. And we're talking about passing on information uh, in a confidential manner and all this. Then it increases your probability of being well, you know, well-being. This also works with clients across or just people, you know, in general, when they are deciding to accept or are willing to go down the path of, Hey, I want to increase my money journey. And this is across all social economic statuses, by the way. You know, if you can get individuals or if you can encourage, not get, but encourage individuals to connect with their own journey. And we ask specifically about students, but it also works with people. Then they're more probable of engaging with their journey and accepting the, the information and becoming more well. So I wanted to ask about diversity in the financial planning industry. I assume that that is an issue that you're attuned to and the industry does like to point to the fact that it's becoming a more diverse profession. But when you look at the data, you can see that it still has a long way to go where you've got just 2% of CFPs who are black and about 25% who are women. So what do you see as the key reasons when you think about it that contribute to this lack of diversity in the profession? Hmm. Well, I think that people need to understand, uh, particularly when it comes to, you know, the non-majority. I don't like minority or any other term. I like the, for, for those in the non-majority, I want people to believe, believe is the key word, that this profession is for them. 
it is for them. And I know there's maybe a trust factor that's been there for a while. And there's been some experiences that have been had, you know, where people have been trying to get into the industry and are in the industry. And then there's been some uh, bad experiences. And then even just on the consumer side to where, you know, they've tried to attain some services and there's been mistrust there. And all those are valid. They're valid. So we have to do a better job in the profession of creating, you know, a better culture uh, for uh, creating those environments that, that I was, you know, speaking on earlier, uh, making sure people are uh, from all walks of life are, you know, seen, valued, heard, belonged, and not trying to do it in some sort of, you know, fake way. You know, you want to, you must have some authenticity. You have to have some willingness in order to do that. All right. That's a, that is a human condition. So that's one thing. And then on the other side is for those folks that want, either want to get into the profession or for those that are seeking service, the belief that this is for you. All right. Money is a public good. Money and money services is a public good. And so it is also, money is also a part of the human condition. So believing that you deserve uh, good service, a good career, you know, either side of that, and that uh, there are champions, there are champions, uh, whether you're a consumer or whether you're trying to pursue the profession, here for you. So not only, so two things. One, this services, these services are for you. This career is for you. Money is for you. Okay. So start your journey. And then number two, you do have champions. And then number three, the profession needs to do a better job of creating environments where folks can come along and, and pursue their aspirations, their, their lives with their life and money. And lastly, I will say that the profession needs to, you know, innovate and, and be creative. It's, it already has, you know, fintech. You know, you have platforms that are ask, uh, you know, offering courses, you have financial coaches, you have, you know, digital offerings, uh, you know, community programs. You have um, so many ways across the spectrum of receiving financial services. So, you know, the way to get into the profession now is not just being a client facing ad advisor inside of a firm. You can do it so many ways now. All right. So you can receive services on the consumer side. And then as far as being a, a career person, you can offer services and, and pursue your career in so many different ways now, which opens up access and gets those numbers up as well. So what do you think educational institutions like yours can do to help drive improvement on the diversity front? Uh, just outreach and, and not just, um, uh, but I would say outreach and, and, and awareness. Uh, and I would say that's across the board. I would say across the board. And, and I know the numbers are what they are, but uh, the real number here is, uh, and I don't like to dismiss um, or jumble up, you know, say everybody's unique experiences, particularly, you know, Black people, because it's been the longest struggle in, in the country. But I would say, you know, young people is an issue. And just the numbers right now as a country and as a world, actually, just the awareness of money, the awareness of financial planning and a financial journey as a service, as a career, you know, the simple lack of awareness, we, we need to do a better job as a profession and as a, as a society and getting the awareness up and saying that this is a thing and we can join in on this. And so some people require a little bit more outreach and uh, we got we have to meet everyone where they are and that takes a little bit more effort. And so, um, you know, for, for example, on campuses, um, you know, I'll be starting this effort next semester, which is speaking to a lot of student organizations. So, you know, picking up the phone or emailing and saying, may I come, may, can our student association, our financial planning student association, can't we come speak to your student organization? And there's all type of student organizations on campus from all walks of life. So, you know, you have, you know, this culture, 
uh, student organization. You have this religious organization. You have this experience. You have this gender organization. You have this artistic organization. You have this whatever. All right. But that takes effort. That takes willingness. If you don't have any willingness or effort, then <laughs> then you're going to come up short. All right. So uh, we need those intangibles of willingness and effort to go find first gen. First gen folks. I mean, there's a, the list is long. So, and young folks and and, and women going on and going on the list. So, willingness and effort to uplift outreach and awareness. So, I wanted to switch over to discuss your financial planning practice because you wear two hats. You're a practicing financial planner, and then you're also a professor. So, with your financial planning practice, concurrent financial planning, what was your thinking in starting up your own firm? versus working with an established RIA or something like that? Ah, uh, yeah, great, great question. So somebody gave me the uh, the, the term, and I'm, there's so many others out there, but uh, I forgot who came up with this term. It's not mine. But somebody said, you, you know, Dr. Cherry, you're a pracademic. And I was like, what? What? Epidemic? What is that? <laughs> <laughs> I thought I, I thought I had a new disease or something, but, uh, <laughs> but a pracademic. So I... Um, you know, I I never wanted when I became an academic, I I never wanted to leave the practice of, of 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 financial planning. So I'm glad I get to do both things and also speak. Um, you know, as far as opening up the practice, I I I wanted to create a philosophy that I could communicate well to uh, the people that I serve, and many many people that are going down the road and picking up their RIA practices. Uh, have similar uh, thought processes, you know, but, you know, for me, it was, you know, the people that I serve, I wanted them to have a investigation of self, the discovery of self. I wanted the, the process to be transformational. I, I had in a life, many life experiences myself, and I knew life and money could be and can be transformational by, you know, defining your aspirations, defining what you don't want to do anymore to what you do want to do and live in an aspirational life, you know, being courageous in that. And it was just a, a philosophical choice and being able to communicate that to others and allow others to go along their self-discovery path. And I can help them as a guide, uh, align their, you know, their life and money, you know, like the, the term is for the for the firm is life money balance. You know, let your life lead your money. And where that came from is that, you know, there were periods in my life to where my life wasn't leading my money. My money was leading my life because I was pouring the money down a rabbit hole that was endless because there was no definition of where I wanted it to go as far as my life was concerned. Um, I was leaving opportunities on the table, just no, no direction. That didn't feel very good, Christine and Jeff. It just didn't feel very good. So when I reversed it and I had this kind of like ah moment, I was like, okay, here's where I want my life to go. Here's what I don't want to do. And here's what I do want to do. And um, that started defining the philosophy of the firm. And so therein lies the the energy for it. Another thing is that uh, I had some experiences at other firms that where, you know, I just had outgrown them. And then also, too, uh, there was a ceiling. I was like, yeah, we could do something different. This is what I'm talking about, you know, as far as just career changes or anybody wants to get in the profession. You got to be innovative and fresh. Or then you're going to have talent that leaves. Now, there was a uh, during that time where I was telling you where I, where I was kind of hitting the ceiling. It was a hitting the ceiling for a couple of things. I was. Uh, there was some a couple of self-destructive things I was doing, but I, but I was still performing in what I was doing. But also, too, a lot of that was um, the places that I was at was unfulfilling. They were unfulfilling. There was no career path. There was no trust. There was no period of belonging. There was no nothing, you know. So there was no other choice but to branch out and do my own thing, Right. So the firm now is now, let's see, 18, 19, 20, 20, 20, five years going on in, and it's about to hit a you know, probably a growth period that I'm excited about. So uh, all, all of those type of things created the firm. But I would just say the biggest driver was a life, a life trigger that I was like, you know, I want someone to experience what I experienced with this 
this transformational, life-altering experience of aspiration. You can do it too. And once that philosophy kicked in, I was like, just want to pass on the glory. That's it. One trend in the financial planning space is for planners to focus on a specific niche, doctors, for example, or women in technology. There's a lot of different niches. Have you targeted a niche or two for concurrent? You know, niches are a double-edged sword for me. I, I know I'm going to raise some hairs for this one. You know, people are like, you got to have a niche. You got to have a niche. Niche, niche. <laughs> you know, potato, potato. Um, you know, for niches, you know, they can give and take. They can, you know, they giveth and they taketh as well. My probably wheelhouse is Generation X. And ironically, Generation X has been passed over for some reason. I don't know. It's like, uh, we're doing the millennial thing. We're even doing the the wires and the Zers. Okay. Uh, so X, Y, Z, that would be a zipper. All right. If those, <laughs> if those, if those people that are familiar with that, uh, my students, uh, they clown me all the time because I'm laughing at my own jokes, but I'm like, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta know what an X, Y, Z zipper is. But anyway, I digress. But you know, the X generation is passed over all the time. And so we got the boomers that pay attention to, but the Xers right now, the wealth from the boomers got to pass through the Xers before they get to the other generation, number one. Number two, they're in their growth mode right now uh, as far as life is concerned. You got to live life now. They're in the sandwich generation. They have grown kids and you know they have twilight parents. So there's so much going on there. Why are they ignored? <laughs> So I, I enjoy working with the Gen X crowd and they also laugh at my jokes. <laughs> uh, we, we, we have cultural references that we can get along with and everything like that, which is cool uh, because they understand, you know, we have a level of understanding. We, we community, you have to create an environment and that's what niches are anyway, too. You know, far as those that uh, create niches like traveling. I know there's a, a fellow on Twitter that does tattoo artists. You know, you got people that hike, you got people that, uh, first generation, you got people that, I mean, the list is endless gaming. I, I know a person that uh, concentrates on people that, uh, does, uh, board games, you know, uh, I mean, it's, 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 it's incredible. So it, you just want to create an environment that to where you can best work with people and people can work where with you because it goes all back to that uh, thing about being comfortable and creating an environment where you feel valued, belong, heard, and all that uh, so you can get to doing the work, as Ms. Lizetta Rainey Braxton would say. So in addition to having a lot of clients who are Xers, you have also said that you have a fair number of clients who are small business owners, and it sounds like you specifically aim to work with some of those folks. So can you talk about some of the key areas of emphasis for small business owners? I don't think that's a topic that we've really talked about on this podcast before, but maybe you can talk about some of the financial issues that tend to be common in those households and also when you look at investment portfolios for those small business owners, do they tend to look any different than are the case for people who aren't self-employed? Yes. Great questions, uh, Christine. So for the small business owner, you know, individuals, period, they have levels of anxiety. They have levels of worry. They have levels of, you know, what's their perception? Levels of perception of now and later. Worry. Um, aspirational. So not, money doesn't always have to be, and life doesn't always have to be full of, you know, trial and worry and anxiety. Some, you know, what do, they, what do, what do we want to do next? What are our aspirations? You know, we can deal with triumph too, you know. But still, these are all thoughts because money is life. Money is experience. Money is, you know, money is every day. So that's when we don't own a business. All right. So those feelings are, are more than likely heightened or elevated when we have a business because we have to have all of those feelings for our businesses too. <laughs> you know, how is the economy and of uh, affecting our business? You know, what's the market cycles of our business? What is what is our next cycle, our next innovation, our next supply decision, our capital decision? 
all of this? What is our perception about now, later, anxiety, worry, all this? So it's doubly so. So what I see in households for those that own businesses is heightened levels of those natural feelings. Okay. That's number one. Number two is we all suffer from the lack of time. I mean, we have a, there's not an infinite amount of time for anyone. We have constrained amounts of time. And so with business owners, you're dealing with your expert area of expertise. Your time is even constrained even more because some people, some people say, well, if I own a business, I don't have a boss. Oh, well, yeah, you do. <laughs> yeah. They're called clients <laughs> and customers. <laughs> right. So, and so you have all of these folks that are constraining on your time you have your family uh, and all of that. So you have a constrained amount of time. You have elevated feelings and then you have constrained amount of time. So you're more than likely, you're going to have to trust somebody. You're going to have to delegate even more. You're going to have to delegate even more to say, who can I trust in order to delegate my money responsibilities, you know, who can help guide our household in a manner to where I can focus and we can focus on our business and do what it needs to do. So those are the two areas that I would see where business owners, as far as investment portfolios is concerned, I, I think the one glaring area is that uh, it's more, um, two areas, two areas. One illiquid because a lot of the capital or a lot of the investments are all tied up in the business. So the business is the retirement or the asset. It is everything. You know, it is the cash flows. The asset is going to hopefully be divested one day or passed along. All right. How do you transfer that into growth, into distribution? Or how do you, how do you do that, all that? All right. So it's an illiquid portfolio, if anything. Um, the second thing, if there is an investment portfolio outside of the business, the level of risk may be too high because entrepreneurs tend to have to say, I'm, I'm investing in myself. All right. So that risk level is there. So that risk level is also saying, okay, maybe I need to transfer that into, uh, you know, the market too. So there's a sense of overconfidence, a sense of overconfidence. So the planner's part at that point is to come in and share some advice or some suggestions on how, how to reduce the illiquidity in, you know, that, you know, the business being all, all end all also having a plan of how to divest or transfer that asset into distribution. And then number three is how to handle the overconfidence risk component in the market. I wanted to ask you about retirement planning a bit. This is obviously been a tough year for investors, especially those getting close to or entering retirement with losses in most portfolios and inflation running high, as we know. What are some of the key concerns that you're hearing from clients and prospective clients during this period of time? Yes. Um, you know, it's quite common to hear about emotions during these times. Uh, that said, you know, the emotions need to be affirmed. They're very valid. Uh, they don't need to be dismissed or belittled. Uh, it would be, you know, better if we could get out in front as professionals. We can, if we can get out in front and call and ask how individuals are feeling right now, you know, give, you know, give them a call. It's kind of like uh, Lionel Richie. You know, I just called to say, right? I just called to say, how are you doing, right? How are you doing? Genuinely asking, how are you feeling right now? And then, and then hear that, okay? And then, of course, we're hearing that, you know, this is different. And I, I don't want to sound cliche, you know, but we had to kindly pass on uh, information because remember I was suggesting that we need to lead, lead with compassion. This is when that's the process. Leading with compassion allows for uh, the education to to commence, the information to be passed. See, and then we can start saying, okay, this is a this is a cycle. This is an economic cycle. This is a market cycle. Uh, this has happened before. And now, just because it happened before, doesn't mean that the person that's feeling it 
doesn't dismiss their feelings, but we can say, you know, we have set up your plan in order to weather instances like this. And this is where setting up expectation during the planning process helps a lot. All right. So when you're at the beginning with clients at the beginning, or if you have long-term clients or during those meetings, you're saying, oh, okay, you know, when we're setting up your plan or we're going through your plan, when these events occur, all right, we're pre-planning for these type of events. So you get to say, okay, I understand you're having these feelings. I, I appreciate you sharing. Um, and for those uncertain events, uh, it's happening right now. The things that you just shared with me right now, that's that uncertainty that we were discussing a few months ago or a year ago. Uh, your feelings are valid, but we actually inserted a smoother in here. And here it is. But here, let's, we, here, here's how we plan for that. So for right now, we have a six-month cushion for you. We have a nine-month cushion. We have a 12-month, whatever it may be, so we don't have to draw down on the market. And this is why we strategize the way we did. And when that information is communicated, because the previous step, one, the expectation was set a while back. Then number two, we led with compassion because we heard what they said, uh, how they felt and validated it and affirmed it. Then number three, we, we got to say, okay, this is what we put in place. And then we get to educate and inform about what's going on in the market and in the economic cycle today, and then how we're going to go forward. So feelings are pretty much the same. All right. They affect individuals different because you got different life cycles. You got different everything because individuals are unique. But the feelings of worry, is it different? Where are we going to go? How are we going to deal with it? This, that, and the other, those tend to be consistent. How you, as a professional, hear and handle those areas transfer to how the household is going to hear, handle those areas. And hopefully uh, your process is in order to where um, you're able to um, help people calm the storm and not be panic in the storm. You've talked about how one of the central issues in helping people with their financial lives is that they have trouble empathizing with and prioritizing their future selves. And this is a topic that we've discussed with other guests. We had Hal Hirschfield on the podcast last summer. He's at UCLA and has looked a lot at this issue. So when you work with clients, how do you help them do that where they're able to see into the future and empathize and think about their future selves? Mm hmm. Yeah. So I love Hirschfield's <laughs> when you're looking in that mirror and you see a complete stranger when you're dealing with money. I'm like, oh, my goodness. I said, have you seen the movie Back to the Future? And I was like, oh, my God, I think it's time for a remake. So many things are remakes now. And uh, so I'll date myself and say Back to the Future. And people say, Dr. Cherry, or at least my students, they're like, what is that? I see. That's why I work in Gen Xers now, because everybody knows what Back to the Future. Is. So anyway, uh, movie studios, if you're listening, let's do a remake. All right. So. But people are not connected with themselves and for the future. So how I like doing that is to walk people through an arc of connection. Walk people through an arc of connection, which is ask us some questions, which is, you know, in the past six months, what is a money event that really resonated with you that you wish you would have done differently? There's a money event that really resonated with you that or stuck out that you wish you would have done differently. I'll pause. And somebody will say, yeah, you know, we, you know, we did this, we did that, blah, blah, blah. He's like, uh, you know, we could have handled that differently or this, that, and the other. Okay. And okay, well, how did it make you feel? Second question. How did you feel about that? Yeah, so, you know, <sighs> You didn't feel too good, or something around those effects. You know, we just could have done better. Uh, just that and the other, and it's pretty. And maybe for, you get some feelings, maybe of regret or or doubt or just any any of those feelings. Third question. All right, if you had uh, some, you know, different type of information, you know, what, what would you do differently? You know, what was what would the new decision be? Oh, here they're perking up now. Oh well. You know, oh, yeah, if we'd have done, we, if we'd had this information. Yeah, we would have done this, that, and the other. Oh, yeah. All right. So, how do you feel about that decision now? 
you know, now that you've done something differently and you have uh, new information. Oh, yeah, that, whew, yeah, that feels a lot better now, you know. Okay, so that's the arc of connecting now with the future. That feeling, that's when I, I say right there, when somebody says, oh, yeah, that feels great. I said, well, that's transformation. That's the process right there. That feeling is the is the it feeling. That feeling that you have, it's indescribable. And that is connecting your now with your later. If you have more information, you know, you have a feeling that you don't want to do. And you've changed it because you have a willingness to change and you've done something differently. And now you feel a different way because you've identified what you do want to do. And it feels better. And you've connected with yourself like, oh, yeah, that's what I want to do. I want to experience that some more. That's transformation right there. And I generally get, it's nine times out of ten, people are like, yes, I get it now. Okay? And if you um, inspire and encourage the connection, then it increases the probability that people will connect with their future selves a little better. Um, and also, too, I like to say this. People don't have to starve themselves now in order to feed the future. We don't have to do extremes. Right now, there's a total disconnect for most people of the future. You know, they're living so much in there now that there's no nutrition for the future. The pendulum doesn't have to swing the other way in extreme either, where you're starving now in order to have malnutrition in the future. So you can do both. It's an and, not an or. It's an and, not an or. However, there has to be a plan in order to feed both. Okay? But if you can, that arc of questioning, that arc of connection that I that I explained, that, that walkthrough that I just explained, if you can inspire to have folks to have that ah moment, that it factor, and they, they understand that feeling, that it feeling, ah, man, you've done something there. Because they feel it. As you know, we've seen a dramatic sell-off in crypto assets over the past year, maybe not focusing on crypto assets specifically, and more on the lessons that investors should, and observers for that matter, should take away from this experience. What do you think are those lessons? Yes. Uh, crypto, you know, is to understand better individuals' uh, risk capacity and risk tolerance. And also knowing what someone's investment plan is in relation to their investment path, you know, as far as their, their pathway of life. You know, that's why mapping out you know, your stages of life is very important, where you want to go, what are your needs are, so on and so forth. Because if you have a uh, a life path, an investment path, when you're planning, all right, then, you know, we have an investment policy at the household level, okay, then it identifies where your strategy needs to be and how you are shaping, shaping your portfolio. And then when you mix that in with, and that's when you get to start, you know, learning far as being more educated, because now you're, as a person and as a household, you're saying, oh, okay, this is our pathway and these are our values. This is where we want to go. Now, invest ourselves in a manner that pushes us down that path. Now, I want to be educated in a manner to understand our path, okay? Again, it goes back to that arc. Once folks are tied in that way, okay, then it says, where do, you know, risky and volatile assets, you know, plug in to where we want to go? Now, that leads to crypto and, and risk capacity and risk tolerance. Now, you may want to take a whole bunch of risk. <laughs> your willingness may be high. All right. But what, what about your capability? What about your capability? And I think this is where uh, these two areas of which I've just introduced, you know, how do assets fit into your investment pathway, your investment policy, your, your strategy, 
And then number two, understanding more how it aligns with what you can do, but what you should do. All right. Your willingness versus your capability. All right. Then it better understands any type of asset, including crypto. All right. Also expectations of what investments are. I mean, crypto is so new, just like any other new asset that <laughs> I've when I, I, I wholesaled back in the day, uh, we had a uh, asset called Risk Parity and Alt Beta. Risk Parity had all these uh, different sleeves of assets, and it was a mechanized area to where it, it moved, and, uh, you know, uh, in a timely fashion. Blah blah blah. I'm, I'm, I'm shortening it up here, but anything the concept was introduced, but the mechanization was new, and how it reacted, it was volatile. That wasn't for everybody. All right. And then according to someone's pathway and someone's understanding someone's, uh, you know, portfolio pathway and also the capacity and also tolerance, all of that weave together, I pretty much understood that that solution probably only needed to be 5% in someone's portfolio. Okay. This is where we are with crypto is putting all of that you know, that story of which I just shared again, when we get to the point to where someone is able to uh, be open to receiving the information and the education of what crypto is and the whole aspect of it, what, what it is now, the beginnings of it, the volatilization of it, this, that, and the other, et cetera, it's like, okay, I could try crypto. All right, but where does it need to be positioned? Where does it belong in my pathway, my investment pathway, this, that, and the other? And what's the expectation? Is 300% is that a realistic expectation? Is 200% a real expectation? No, that is not. Okay. So what it does to answer your question very specifically and using the things that I just spoke of, it does reiterate the fundamentals of the arc of investing period to accomplish an individual's investment strategy. That's what it does. Well, Dr. Cherry, this has been such an illuminating conversation. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. Well, I appreciate you having me. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on The Long View. If you could, please take a moment to subscribe to and rate the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can follow us on Twitter at Christine underscore Benz and at S-Youth1, which is S-Y-O-U-T-H, and the number one. George Cassidy is our engineer for the podcast, and Carrie Gretchik produces the show notes each week. Finally, we'd love to get your feedback. If you have a comment or a guest idea, please email us at thelongview at morningstar.com. Until next time, thanks for joining us. This recording is for informational purposes only and should not be considered investment advice. Opinions expressed are as of the date of recording. Such opinions are subject to change. The views and opinions of guests on this program are not necessarily those of Morningstar Inc. and its affiliates. Morningstar and its affiliates are not affiliated with this guest or his or her business affiliates unless otherwise stated. Morningstar does not guarantee the accuracy or the completeness of the data presented herein. Jeff Patak is an employee of Morningstar Research Services, LLC. Morningstar Research Services is a subsidiary of Morningstar Inc. and is registered with and governed by the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission. Morningstar Research Services shall not be responsible for any trading decisions, damages, or other losses resulting from or related to the information, data analyses, or opinions, or their use. Past performance is not a guarantee of future results. All investments are subject to investment risk including possible loss of principal. Individuals should seriously consider if an investment is suitable for them by referencing their own financial position, investment objectives, and risk profile before making any investment decision.